Uh, today's uh, primary scripture is from Romans chapter 12, and we have that on the screen. I, I'd invite you, would you, to uh, and let, let's, let's stand in honor of God's word, and let's, let's read this uh, together from Romans chapter 12. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. May that be true of us together, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, I want to invite up a very special guest, Pastor uh, Maesh Mayena from Nairobi, Kenya. So, Maesh, let's welcome Pastor Maesh. We're just going to have a little conversation here before he takes us into God's Word. And, uh, brother, you have that microphone? Good morning. Is that working? We never Can you hear me? Or oh, is it too far? Let's see. Is that better? That should. Is that working, guys? Okay. Okay. Um, I got to know Pastor Mesh about 10 years ago when he first went to Africa, and uh, you can see his full name there. C is for Christopher, but uh, you said, what, what happens if somebody calls you Christopher? What does that mean? Well, um, there are very few people who get to use Christopher, and one of those is my mother when she was alive, and if she ever called me Christopher, then I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So when I hear people calling me Christopher, I get concerned. Okay. But you can so, call me Maish. <laughs> yeah, Maish is a nickname that uh, that happened in university. Yes. Days, I believe you do. Yeah, and it's um, drawn out of Maina. So if you call me Maish, I'll respond quicker. So if it's an emergency, call me Maish. I will, I will react faster okay. than if you call me anything else. Yeah. And you have a beautiful family. Would you tell us about them? <sighs> well... This makes me feel homesick. I have been in the U.S. for just over 10 days, I think, um, so far. But yeah, that's the family that the Lord has blessed me with. I, I hope you guys understand English. I'll try to speak some American, but um, I'm more comfortable with English. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's my wife. Uh, that's me with my wife, Elizabeth. Uh, we, we, we call her Zisa. That's her you know, um, Kenyan name, Nzisa. Uh, a lot of Americans struggle with saying Nzisa. So I think you guys are doing fine. And we are blessed with three daughters, Mercy, who is 17. I think you can guess which one is Mercy over there. And then we have our middle child, Imani. Imani means faith in Swahili. She's nine. Um, and Zuri is daddy's girl. I think she's the one who's missing me the most. Uh, every time I call home, she asks me if I'm coming home now. Uh, so that's, that's Zuri, she's six years old. And allow me to mention that um, when I first met um, uh, Pastor, is it Pastor or Reverend? Steve? Uh, just Steve. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve yeah, and Darlene, yeah. uh, they had come visiting us in our home. And Imani was due to be born, I think, about a month the nine-year-old uh, girl, and they left her um, a little stuffed uh, doll that she, when she was born, she cl clung onto it, you know, for many, many years. I think it's still there somewhere, you know, yeah. yeah. So that's my family. Yeah, and uh, yeah, what a beautiful family. Now, you have been, uh, you were, when we met you, you were the associate pastor at yes. uh, Life Spring Chapel, which is just outside of Nairobi in a, in a very bustling uh, part mm -hmm. of that growing city mm -hmm. in uh, Kenya. And uh, if we go to the, the next slide. Uh, oh, yeah, just take a look at this one. This is a, a little bit of an older picture. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? And um, mm -hmm. I miss them. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're not going to be able we to We have lots of fun. <laughs> these, these, these dear people. Yeah, yeah. and so... Um, there's so many vibrant ministries going on. Nemesh was the associate pastor, then went to a church plant, and, and then came back as the senior pastor of Life Spring Chapel. Uh, and that's been three or four years, yes. something like that. Four years since I took over in, yes. in, in January, actually. Yeah, now, yeah. now I actually oversee several church plants uh, as a major responsibility. But there's a lot going on. We don't have time to talk about all of it. but. Uh, 
Um, you are a great model for us of your commitment to the next generation of children. So tell us a few things mm -hmm. about, um, about the children. You have three, at least three major children's ministries, but tell us about that a little bit. Well, Life Livestream Chapel is about 18 years old now, um, since a team was sent out by our mother church, Nairobi Chapel. So some of you, I don't know if you're familiar with Nairobi Chapel, um, but Life Spring Chapel. You know what, we're gonna make an adjustment here. It looks better this way. Sorry to be intrusive. Well, that's fine. Does that feel better? Is that better? Well, um, I don't think it's designed for African ears. But <laughs> <laughs> That's um, <wrong> yeah. <laughs> but um, we are about 18 years old, and uh, this, this is the first location where this photo is taken, that Lifespring Chapel came to. We now have uh, four other locations. Uh, but when we moved here, the, the area was not as populated as it is right now. Uh, but over the years, uh, we just sensed that God intentionally sent us to this place. And we called it Life Spring because the founding pastor saw a vision of a place where people can come and have their thirst quenched uh, from springs of life, um, which was Jesus Christ. Um, and we are seeing that happening more and more now. Uh, we have um, an amazing uh, opportunity to reach out to children in three main ministries. One of them is um, our Compassion Assisted Project, which has over 350 children who come every Saturday to the church. Uh, this was a VBS. Uh, we integrate children from the slum and the members of the church, and we do lots of such programs. Uh, but then we also, we also um, were blessed to have a facility uh, for children that we felt it would be um, such a waste if we had a building that is available to minister to children and it's only used over the weekend. So we decided to begin a school uh, because in the area that we are in, it's so densely populated and there are no public schools. Uh, so we started a school at, uh, as a church and now the school has 150 children uh, who have um, access to uh, affordable, sustainable, you know, good quality uh, education. Uh, and then of course Sunday, we have another 150 or so children who come to our children's church. So in a week, we, I think our children's ministry is the biggest ministry because we reach close to 700 children every week through this, uh, this ministry. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. Another uh, impressive ministry of Life Spring Chapel that um, has, has been uh, an encouragement to us has been your emphasis on leadership development. Yes. And, and finding uh, young men and women uh, who seem to have gifts for pastoral leadership. And uh, so you have a, a, a virtually a seminary, a robust uh, uh, intern program. And so say a few things about that. I think this is a picture of some of them being commissioned. Yeah, this is a graduation for our pastoral trainees. We have a program, which I have been part of. I, I came in. Um, about, I think, I would say 15 or 16 years ago as an intern, um, which is a year where people who are interested in, in ministry come to sort of um, define what it is that they sense God is calling them to. And if that, after that one year you, um, you sense God calling you into full-time ministry, then you sign up for another two years of pastoral traineeship, which is what now we were graduating um, men and women who had gone through that program and becoming pastors on our team. All our pastors have been raised up through uh, this program uh, in all the five locations that we have. Um, and uh, I think you, you met Pastor Eric, who now leads one of our church plants. Uh, he was an intern, very energetic, passionate young man. Uh, I don't know what kind of experience he gave you. Uh, but well, this- we were, we were, uh, Darling and I were walking with Eric through the, the slum that's nearby, and uh, some uh, uh, older boys were laughing at us, and uh, Eric couldn't stop laughing. I said, what they say? what they say? And he said, well, they're calling you Father Christmas. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, we, yeah. we had a lot of fun with Eric. He's a great pastor. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the next slide is another 
more recent ministry of uh, taking this, uh, it's a fairly small property, but they're using it to the fullness, and that's to develop some, uh, some uh, small businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's not just to use the property and have a little bit of income, but tell us what the vision is there with uh, mm -hmm. these businesses that have started up on the property. Well, um, the founders of the church had discernment to find property in the area. It didn't look anything like it does right now. It was just open field when we moved into that space. And we bought an acre uh, of land uh, with frontage onto two roads. And at the time, we didn't know what it would um, pan out to become. But then right now, um, we have, uh, I would say, 30 shops on the perimeter. Because it's a dense, densely populated area. People are, are trying to do businesses, small businesses, to um, earn a living. So we decided, instead of just building a wall around the perimeter, to bring in freight containers, 40-foot freight containers. And we have six of them um, just uh, providing us a security to the property, but also um, has a, serves as shops. Uh, little shops that people can rent. Now, what this has done is, 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 is two things. One, um, it has provided much-needed income to the church because in a month, um, we are able to raise about 25% of our monthly budget out of the income from the rent. But then the secondly, it has put us into contact with small business traders. Um, and, and because of the church, we have a lot of gifts within the community of the church. We have business people, people who can mentor and train other business, uh, business leaders. We um, invite in this business uh, owners, small business owners for training, you know, on, on just basic uh, record keeping, uh, simple marketing, how do you package and brand uh, yourself. And attached to that is a discipleship program. Uh, because we believe that it is God, like it says in Deuteronomy 8, that it's God who gives us the ability to generate wealth. And doing business God's way is the best way uh, to do business. Um, I think there's a slide there of a graduation. Um, yeah, this, this is a graduation uh, of one of the programs that we have in the church of business um, owners. These people don't necessarily attend church at Life Spring, but they do businesses around the church. And they went through, um, I think, about three months of training led by one of the young people who've done internship, uh, a, a business graduate who did our internship program and felt called to help equip small business owners. So he has a program that he takes them through, and we sponsor that. And we were having a graduation in church. And an interesting thing that was happening, you see the guy who is dressed up uh, like a comedian, you know, that's actually his trade. Yeah, he does business as a comedian. And on this particular day, as we were doing the graduation, uh, this young man took the mic, asked for the mic, and he took the mic, and he said that the experience had touched him so much that he would like to accept Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord. And we prayed for him right there, and he received Jesus Christ as Lord over his life, and that just blesses my heart. If there's anything else, I mean, nothing else comes out of it, you know, something like this would make it much more worthwhile to do this program. Is this fantastic or what? Um, Praise God. There's, there's, there's so much more that can be said, and perhaps in, in, in uh, Maisha's sermon, he'll, he'll uh, have some examples. Uh, among other things, uh, 10 years ago, we, we, we start talking about the possibility of uh, doing some partnerships with student missions in the orphanage in West Kenya called Shangalia that uh, our, our youth pastor Randy Sensgard got us connected with years ago. Uh, well, I didn't even realize till one of our more recent trips to Kenya that, that he's been taking uh, students there and interns there for training uh, for a few years now. Mm -hmm. And so even this week, something you pray about, uh, uh, Carl and I and Maish were we're just kind of brainstorming about could it be that some of our students and college students could go to Nairobi, meet up with some of our covenant folks as well as LifeSpring people, and have kind of a joint mission together, you know, Kenya students and, and American students going out to uh, the children at Shangali at the orphanage. And it just seems like that could be uh, so good for so many different people. So that's something we're, we're praying about for the years uh, ahead. 
Uh, let me also mention that he's a, he's a fan of the Nairobi Ro Broncos <laughs> as well. And, uh, well. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I don't, you don't understand American football. You, you played the real football, right? Where you use your feet called soccer. We call yes, soccer, but, yes. Um, now one more, just one more slide, two more slides. Uh, obviously, obviously at Life Spring they worship the living Christ. And uh, when I, we first went there was just a tent, but now they have constructed a, a building for worship and other purposes. And then there's another slide where um, there, people don't sit still that much during yeah. your gatherings, do they? A lot like Beth, you know, uh, you saw her moving here. You know, she's, she's Kenyan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and uh, obviously worship is, is at the heart of uh, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, mm -hmm. and so as our offerings are received, uh, Mayesh is gonna, going to teach you a song in Swahili. And uh, so the next slide, I, I believe, has, has mm -hmm. the words. We're going to hear the music. And at this point, we'll invite the ushers to come and receive any offerings that you might have for God's word through this fellowship. And I'll let you then take over and teach us and then move right into your, our time in God's word. Uh, but thank you, Mayesh. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Can I call you Pastor Steve? What do you guys call him? It's just Steve? Okay. I'll try and get used to that. You can call, you can call me anything you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, are you ready to do some dancing and singing? It's very simple, as you can see, it's just a song of praise, um, thanking, uh, celebrating who Jesus is to us, and that he gives us life, life eternal, okay? Now, um, unlike here, and I love the way you guys do worship, I am a big fan of casting crowns, and when they come to Nairobi, we uh, have to go for their concerts, so we love uh, American music, but African music cannot be done while seated. So I'm going to ask you to just rise up and indulge me a little bit. Um, I don't know, Catherine, were you there at, when we did this song in Minneapolis? Okay, so then you can teach us as well. Okay. Um, now, it's, it's, it's very easy. Say, Yesu Niwangu. Excellent. If you can read... Um, Spanish, Swahili is phonetic. So what you see is how it is pronounced, okay? So Yesu Niwangu. So the actions go like Yesu Niwangu. Yesu Niwangu. Jesus is mine, okay? And then when you say Wauzima, Wamilele, this is what you do. Wauzima, wamilele, wauzima, wamilele. Can you do that? Wauzima, wamilele, wauzima, wamilele, wauzima, wamilele, wauzima, wamilele. Yesu ni wangu ni wauzima, wamilele. Yesu ni wangu ni wauzima, wamilele. We got it, isn't it? Okay, we can turn off the music and let's do this a cappella. Okay, can we do this? All right, let's go. Yes, ni wangu ni wazima wa milele. Yes, yes, ni wangu ni wazima wa milele. Ana ni penda ni wazima wa milele. Ana ni penda ni wauzima wa milele. Ana ni jali ni wauzima wa milele. Ni wauzima, o milele ni wauzima, ni wauzima. Ni wauzima, wa milele ni wauzima, wa milele ni wauzima. Excellent. You can clap for yourselves. You may be seated. All right. Um, 
Thank you so much, Sue, for joining me as I bring God's word to us. I hope that I am understandable, and if there's anyone who doesn't understand me, just, just put up your hand, and we'll see how to help you. Okay? All right. So most of us understand English, all right? Uh, allow me to read um, that scripture uh, once again. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word that is alive today. And uh, Lord, we believe that you have prepared a banquet for us uh, that we can feed and be nourished because what we need is the bread of life. We need you to illuminate our minds and to open up our hearts to receive that which uh, you have laid out for us to receive today. May you use it, O oh Lord, to transform us, to change us, to encourage us, and to also charge us forth to live out your mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I recall early in the year 2008, um, sometime in January, the country of Kenya had experienced horror at a scale like we had never experienced before. The nation had come out of months of election violence unlike we had known before. And this, this is what um, the Human Rights Watch had to say about it. That the scale and the speed of the violence that engulfed Kenya following the controversial presidential elections of December 27, uh, 2007, shocked both Kenyans and the world at large. Two months of bloodshed left over 1,000 dead and up to 500,000 internally displaced persons in a country viewed as a bastion of economic and political stability in a volatile region. The roots of that violence stemmed from um, what we believe to be ethnic tensions that politicians had whipped up and they had learned how to exploit for their personal gain. My interest in this is not necessarily to highlight um, you know, the pain and the anguish that we experienced at that time. But I am mentioning this so that I can highlight what I witnessed as the power of the body of Christ in bringing healing to a broken world. I was fortunate to have been invited to contribute time and resources towards an effort by the Church of Kenya to intervene in the aftermath of the violence. We were fragmented as a nation, um, and people did not know how to come back together. We did not know uh, how then we would knit this national um, tapestry and bring us back and, uh, and, and, and just connect us to become a people again. But we knew that it would take the hand of God to bring about healing. While many institutions were at work to bring, bring reconciliation and healing, only the church was poised to provide a lasting solution. This is because the church of God is his instrument for the transformation of a broken world. The initiative was called Msafara, which means caravan, and it was a response of love and reconciliation, which brought together up to 300 uh, different churches um, and, and, and church leaders from diverse ethnicities and denominations. And we came together, the young and the old, and we mobilized relief responses from churches, you know, food, clothing, and any help that we could get uh, from the Church of Kenya. And we sought to travel 
to walk the ground and to visit with people who had been affected. And we were to travel from the coastal town, the beautiful town of Mombasa, the city of Mombasa, um, and, and hold prayers and reconciliation meetings in each of those cities all the way to Nairobi and cutting across to the western part of the country. We walked where blood had been shed, where there was pain and people still recovering uh, from difficulties. And, and we saw all these things. But then we also saw the power and the beauty of the church united to confront the, a common enemy in, in perhaps what will, was going to linger uh, for long. In, 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 in each of those towns, we would hold meetings of repentance. And, and, and because it was believed that um, the church had become involved in some of the pain that was experienced, it was important that people would see leaders, church leaders, coming together, asking for forgiveness from one another, and then also asking um, that the Lord would heal the land uh, because blood had been shed. And uh, as scripture uh, would say, uh, that um, God does not leave any sin unpunished. And he, he was going to do something about that. And we needed to repent on behalf of the nation. It was a difficult time uh, to experience. I believe in the church and its place to be the true agent of transformation for mankind. I believe in the power of the church and this power of the church is seen in instances um, of inclusivity, in instances not of exclusivity and segmentation, but instances where there is an embrace and a welcome into one body. Uh, I believe in the celebration of diversity, uh, the variety that God has created and put into mankind, the differences um, that, that we see. Like in a country like ours, we have um, 43 different tribes. And if we look carefully, each one of those tribes has something to offer to what we call the nation of Kenya. You know, um, you all know about, about running, isn't it? And Kenya is good at, at, at running the marathon. Now, I can tell you, not every tribe in Kenya is gifted in running the marathon. <laughs> I, for one, am not from, from that tribe, and I cannot run a kilometer without you know, um, uh, struggling through it. But then there's a community up in the mountains, uh, the Kalenjin, who when they run, they just run until someone has to tell them to stop. You know? <laughs> um, we have a community in the, in the eastern part of the country which is you know, very spiritual in their response to, 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 to God and creation. And amazingly, this community has provided this our nation some of the best theologians, you know, African theologians and, and, and church leaders uh, of our time. We, um, I love the cuisine of the coastal communities. They're different from us. Uh, they, 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 they cook um, a dish that, you know, stands out from all other kinds of dishes. I love um, the, the scholarliness of the people from, you know, the Shangilia community out there, uh, Lee Robinson, you know, the people in Kisumu and, and that side, they are, um, some of our best professors come from that community. And there is diversity and a richness in uh, the nation of Kenya. I believe in that it's the same even with the world. You know, the world is different. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know if the world will miss anything if America was not there. Do you think there's anything that the world will miss? <laughs> Plenty, isn't it? You know, there's a lot that God has blessed uh, this country with. You know, I love the order. I love, you know, the way, um, the, the technological innovations. I love, um, so far, the people. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had a nasty experience. I, I'll tell you that I was concerned when I was coming out here. Because what, what we see in it, uh, uh, you know, on TV is not very welcoming and encouraging. And I had been warned that uh, when I get to the, to the border, to the airport, and... Uh, I'm from Africa, I should be prepared for a lengthy security experience. Well, I haven't had any of that, you know. Little did I know that the TSA was changing their rules. Did you know that? 
you know, and they're going to make it much easier. So we just had a breeze through custom. They didn't even open my bags. I was surprised. They just asked me, what are you carrying? I told them, I'm carrying Kenyan tea and coffee for uh, Pastor Steve. And they told me, well, welcome. We all love Kenyan tea and coffee, so you can come in. <laughs> I love the people here. And I'm sure if we think about different communities and ethnicities that God created in this world, we would see how rich it makes our experience of living in this world. I believe then that the church, um, while it is one, ought to celebrate the diversity that is found in the creation. But then I also believe that the church has a unified purpose. We see um, our Lord Jesus in John chapter 17 being very intentional about something. There are many things that he had been teaching uh, his disciple uh, building up to John chapter 17, and it was towards the time that he would be betrayed and crucified. And in Africa, we take very seriously um, the words of a dying man. I don't know what it's like here, but in Africa, we listen carefully. And it would seem that Jesus' the things that Jesus would um, say towards you know, John chapter 14 onwards, um, to this point of, of um, his prayer in chapter 17 are very important because he knew that his time was coming to an end and he needed to prepare his disciples for what it is that they were going to experience uh, in, the, in the days to come. And in John chapter 17, our Lord Jesus makes some very intentional prayers. You know, and I would say that he made these prayers because there are things that were weighing heavily on the Lord's heart and uh, that had so much significance. He prays for the apostles from his heart. He knew what lie ahead and that what was coming would test their faith in ways that they had never experienced before. You know, in, Jesus had been speaking to them about some very hard things. And they probably had a heavy heart up to this point. And he prays for them. You know, um, and he lifts up a prayer that, that, that God would help them in that which they were going to experience. He knew that no matter how much he prepares them, they will need a lot of help to survive the season that was coming. He therefore turns to the Father in prayer on their behalf. And distinct in the prayer that he gives is a portion that I want to uh, spend a little bit more time focusing on, and it begins in, in verse 20, where he in turn prays for the worldwide church, those who will believe after the apostles. In that, we get a glimpse of a vision that he was seeing uh, up ahead of a church that would come in the future. And it was important enough that Jesus thought to pray for unity. This is what he says in John chapter 17. My prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples, uh, the apostles. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. In a prayer from his heart, and an important prayer at that, it is important that we um, pay attention to Jesus' insight about what uh, many centuries later will be one of the most powerful ingredients for effectiveness in the mission that he would live uh, with the apostles and with the believers. The outcome of what he would soon accomplish on the cross would be, would be to bring diverse ethnicities under one body. Paul says um, in Acts 17, that you know, it is God who created 
the many nations. And the word that he uses there about nations, it's not even countries as we know them now. It's actually ethnicit ethnicities, you know, different people groups. Okay? So it is God who, creates, who, who, who created uh, the different people who have different tongues, different colors, different expressions, different giftings as, as communities. And, and then um, we, we know that the work of Jesus, you know, through the first Adam, many nations were created. Through the work of Jesus, many nations would become one. Praise the Lord. You know, where I, where I come from, we say amen. You can speak back at the preacher. And it's, like, it's acceptable. Okay? And what he was going to accomplish on the cross soon after making this prayer would bring the diverse ethnicities under one body. You know, um, the many different uh, people. That, uh, Paul says there's no Jew, no Gentile, no uh, um, you know, barbarian, but that there will be one citizenship, one people, the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul, who was sent to the Gentiles, recognized the inclusivity of the work of the cross. That Christ, in Colossians 3, says, Christ is all and is in all. You know, he created all nations and ethnicity through the first Adam, and he brings them all under one body through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Christ is all and is in all. You know, when I came in here, I just felt a connection, um, you know, a brotherhood. I felt at home amongst a people who worship Jesus. Because he has deposited in my heart, you know, that identity of being, you know, a son of the Most High God. And I am looking at sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are one family. Amen? We are one people connected through Jesus Christ. You know, the connection came at a price. And when we live out the unity, then we celebrate the price that Jesus paid so that we may become one. Paul challenges us to intentional, active pursuit and, the pro and protection of the unity of the body. The church, therefore, is one. We may have diverse ethnicities. We may have class differences, race, different races, experiences, giftings, but we have one church. You know, it's very easy to look at the world. It's very easy for me to look at where life spring is and count the number of churches that are there. It's very easy to look at the world and say, you know, there are thousands of churches in this world. But you know what, brothers and sisters? We do not have thousands of churches, but we have one church, the church of Christ. Amen. The church is one with many parts, and the church can only effectively pursue its mission in unity, not as a fragmented church, not in competition with one another. The church has a common enemy and one mission. So then it becomes important for us to respond to, so what is it then that would, make it would, would help us to operate as one church? The first thing that I want to highlight is uh, the place of the master. Jesus in Matthew um, chapter 16, when he came to the region of uh, Philippi, and he was having a conversation with his apostles, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? You know, and they give him the answers that they do, but then he turns to them, just like I am turning to you. Who do you say Jesus is? Because understanding the place of Christ will inform everything else that the church looks like beyond there. Who is your master? Who is your Lord? This is a foundational question that we must ask and seek answers for ourselves. You know, it's a question of source and purpose. If we are the church, 
then we must seek the answer to the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Because the church does not exist outside of Jesus Christ. If I answer it right, then I would say, then Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, like Peter answered, you know, when he says he's the Messiah, it's in recognition of his own helplessness to help himself and the need for a Messiah who would come and rescue uh, humanity. When we say, you know, he's the Son of the living God, we acknowledge his identity an identity that even God himself, himself affirms at baptism and he also affirms at the transfiguration. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The church came at a cost. It is not a man-made body. It took God himself to come down and to walk the earth and to immerse himself in the brokenness of humanity to to redeem those who would believe in him. It cost him a painful, shameful death on the cross to lavish upon us his love and to bring us into the family that is known the family of God. The church is God's idea. It is not our idea. The church is instituted by, by God. The church is an object of his love. The church carries the image of God. Jesus in his prayer prays that the believers would be just as he and the Father are one. That through the unity of the church, the body best represents God. In our fragmentation, then we do a disservice to the image of God. But when we come together, we best represent who God is. Through the unity of the Trinity, we received salvation. Through the unity of believers, the purpose and the mission of our master can be accomplished. Amen? In verse 22, Christ says that he has ordained that the unified body will be glorious. That the glory that Christ has received from the Father when he walked on earth, you know, glory means that he reflected the true character, the power, and the wisdom of God. It is only in our working together that we can actually be called the body of Christ. Otherwise, then it would be perhaps the finger of Christ or the hand of Christ or the leg of Christ. But when we come together, we become the whole body of Christ. So this unity cannot communicate to the world the greatness of God. Unity is not easy, yet it is achievable. In his prayer, Jesus must have known that it will not be easy for believers to find unity. I mean, if you have found it easy to bring churches together, then um, bless you. Yeah. I know it is not an easy thing. It, it, it is hard enough for our Lord to pray about because he recognized that it would need divine intervention for the church to become one. It would, need, it would need divine empowerment to achieve. And we must, without ceasing, continually pray for the unity of the church. Well, I hope we are in African time, because in Africa, the whole, <laughs> uh, uh, when we go to church, it is a day of church. So I hope we are not in a hurry uh, to leave. Uh, but I'll try. I'll try and get somewhere in between. Um, The master enjoys diversity. You know, if Jesus is a master of the church, if he is the Lord of the church, then we must know that he enjoys diversity. Because diversity is a, is a testament to his creativity. You know, it is God who created all these diverse uh, things that we've seen. Uh, I really love God's creation because um, God did not create only, um, you know, one of, of, of everything. I mean, everything is unique. But you would find, um, like for instance, we know we need vitamin A, isn't it? Is vitamin A only found in carrots? So if you don't like carrots, 
you can eat something else that has vitamin A, isn't it, that you like. So God creates diversity because it, it, it expresses who he is, a creative God. You know, he's not boring. You know, he's creative. Uh, and as believers, we are also gifted according to the will of the Spirit for the benefit of the body. Creation coexists in the harmony of interdependence. Um, no one element of creation can exist in isolation from the others. We could try, but it, it, it is not possible to exist in isolation. We are created to be interdependent of each other. The church must know who their master is because it is not possible to serve two masters. The Bible says that we cannot serve two masters. And in John chapter 8, Jesus was actually very harsh. Um, he seemed to be saying that if I am not your master, then your master is the devil. There cannot be an in-between there. So the church must be clear about who their master is. You either have God as the master or you have the opposite as true. We must settle the question of who our master is and draw out of it the question of purpose. Because if God is the master of the church and the church is God's idea and that he created it for a purpose, therefore, we must answer the question, then what is our mission? What is our mission? At Life Spring Chapel, we, we, we must constantly raise our perspective to the lordship of, of, of Christ, and we must always look to Jesus as a master. And as subjects of his kingdom, we know that we are uniquely um, uh, challenged to pursue his kingdom and not our own kingdom. It's very easy for me to pursue my own little kingdom as Life Spring Chapel, but we must constantly look up to Jesus and recognize that it is his church and it is his kingdom. And when I look at things that way, then it frees me to embrace the global body of Christ in accomplishing the mission that God has called us to. Because as you have seen in the photos of Life Spring Chapel, the need is great. It is immense. No one church can address the needs of humanity adequately. I must extend a hand of, of unity to the neighboring church and work together with them towards accomplishing the mission that God has given to us. The mission of the church as a called out representation of who the master is, is to glorify God and to extend his kingdom. In his book, Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby says this, to be related to Christ is to be on mission with him. We cannot be in relationship with Jesus and not be on mission. In verse 21 of John, uh, John 20, 21, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Our relationship with the master is a love relationship, the outcome of which is a hunger to join Christ in his mission. We don't, we don't do the mission of God because, how, how would I put it? Um, our doing the mission of God is not our expression of love. Our expression of love results in us engaging in the mission of God. Does that make sense? It's a little con convoluted, but it, was, um, it opened my mind when I understood that, yes, I join him in his mission because I love him. And out of our relationship, then he clarifies what my purpose in his mission is, and it delights me to join him in what he's doing. The big picture is that the church exists to glorify God. I've said that and expand his kingdom. So the church is essentially a missional community. We are a mission you know, we are sent. And a missional church takes after the master. And if we are to study the master and his expression of his mission, then we see that he came. Okay? He came. He moved from where he was. He was intentional. You know, he came. And he was incarnational. He immersed himself into our culture. He immersed himself into humanity. 
He was inclusive. Jesus, you know, drew in people as opposed to being exclusive. He hung out with the sinners. He hung out with the tax collectors, the outcasts, the people who would otherwise be rejected in society. He drew them in. He gave himself fully to the work of the Father that he had been sent to. Jesus prays um, that the, the, the body of Christ would be sanctified, that he himself, having been set apart for ministry, that we would also get set apart and then be built up. He says he's the one who works in us to present us perfect in the day of his coming. So as we journey with him, as, as he sanctifies us, then we become more and more aware of our part in the mission of God, and then we join him in what he is doing. So diversity means that we have a unique offering to the mission, that where every part of the body counts in its uniquenesses. I've heard people say that, you know, um, in Africa, there is an amazing spirituality, and it is true that people just love worshiping the Lord. You know, people brought the gospel to Africa, and now um, we, we are feeling that Africa has the opportunity of taking the gospel to the world. But then, there is um, a, a falsehood that is being perpetrated, that Africa no longer needs missionaries from the West. But it is not true, okay? Because that would not be a celebration of diversity. Every part of the body of Christ brings something to the mission of God. And I want to encourage us, even as the American church, to find places of you know, convergence with the global church, to bring in our gifts, to come in all our glory, because you know, we'll enter heaven in all our glory, just the way we are. You know, some of us will come in dancing, some will not, but that is part of the beauty of the creation that God has put together. There is a part to play in the American church as part of the global body of Christ. I mean, we have benefited immensely from you know, the scholarly input of seminaries in the US and publishing that has happened from here, missionaries coming over. I mean, the dollar has done amazing things for the kingdom, amen? You know, and we have to celebrate that. It is part of what God has blessed his body with, and we must release it for the work of the gospel. We must recognize that we are in mission and that we are a missional community. And finally, then these first two things inform our methods. Our culture, our values, our beliefs express themselves in the practices of what we do. Understanding the master and his mission informs the practices um, of us as a church. And it is at the place of method that man's innovation and creativity is exercised. You know, a local church understands that the master's mission quickly, um, I mean, a local church that understands the master's mission quickly recognizes its limitation in going after it alone. Uh, we realize that the need is so much greater than we can do individually. The need is so much greater. I mean, it would be, it, it would be quite a feat if the music team had one person, isn't it? Playing all the instruments. Don't you think it would be amazing? But God has not made it that way, that we would have someone who plays the percussion and the string instruments and, you know, vocal cords, and all that comes beautifully into the music that praises the Lord. You know, there are people who are serving in the children's ministry, and it, they, they, it's made possible because God has gifted us within even the local body of Christ differently. And no one person, no one pastor can do it all. Every gift has to find its place. And the same thing, you know, in Denver, we need to join up with other churches in doing good in our society, recognizing what the needs are in this community, and collectively we will be able to confront and address the needs in a much greater way than if we try to do it alone. Our methods 
must reflect who our master is and what our mission is. Our united church identifies that we are not each other's enemy. We have a common enemy. And the common enemy is not the person who's seated next to you. It is not the church that is next door. Our common enemy is the devil. And where, as Centennial Covenant Church, you can send a thousand to flight, if you join up with one other one, you can send how many to flight? 10,000 demons to flight. Can we say that? You know, it makes it um, in the synergy that comes out of joining together is so much greater than the sum of the parts. So a wise person will realize the strength that is found in the gifts in the church, harness them for kingdom purpose, provides opportunity for the gifts to be applied and celebrate the giver of good gifts. Because when the gifts find expression, God is glorified. And the kingdom is expanded. Our Lord understood this. And he made a prayer for the unity of the body of Christ. He had a dream for the church. I have a dream for the church. I believe in the church. I believe in the love of the master. For it is love that envisioned the church. I believe in the beauty of diversity. Not uniform, but, but equal. I believe the church has every gift to serve mankind and bring glory to the master. I believe in the power of unity, for in wholeness we are greater than in isolation. I believe that the hope of mankind is sitting in the pews, serves in diversity and in diverse places of contact, whether it is in the church or in the marketplace, influencing the world for the better. I believe in the power of the prayer of the righteous, for it is effective. Jesus, who was without sin, prayed for the unity of the church. I believe that it is possible that our Lord prayed and it will come to pass to the glory of God and for the expansion of the kingdom. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Shall we pray? I'd like us to pray with our hands out in the open, for it's a sign of surrender, a sign that we have a master and we are surrendering to him. Just have your eye, hands open to the master. And it's also a sign that we are ready to receive the blessings of the Most High, but also the hands are a sign of the giftedness, the uniquenesses. You know, our fingers have unique fingerprints. Our hands are gifted uniquely for the kingdom. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the Messiah. You are the Lord of us all. You are the Lord of the church. And we submit to you. Help, help, help us, Lord, even in times of our unbelief. Help us in times when we have not seen um, you know, uh, who you are in, in our places or in our families, in times when we have not felt that we have a master who cares for us. Lord, may you remind us of that truth even right now. You are the Lord. 
You are our master. Thank you for the gifts that you have blessed the church with. That each one of us who is here is uniquely blessed. That you have placed in our hands gifts that have the power to transform humanity. Lord, we surrender those gifts. We dedicate them to you. We set them apart for your use. Do as you will, O oh Lord. And as you send us out to your mission, you send us with your power because the Holy Spirit is upon us to be witnesses in all the places that you have sent us to. But you are also present for you say that you would be with us to the very end of the age. We believe that and we step out in confidence. We pray this in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And as we head out today, let's go out singing the song that just reminds us that we are one church.